an F1 wing it can produce over 500 kilograms of downforce and help cars corner at over 5G. Not that long ago, they were nearly removed from F1 altogether. We're going to go through how we went from this to this and now to wings that look more like this. Oh, and also how we ended up with some of the really crazy ones. We're very used to rear wings in F1, but back in the early days, things were very different. During the 1950s and most of the 1960s, F1 cars didn't have any wings. They were very streamlined and focused on straight line speed. So designers focused on making them great at slipstreaming. And although they didn't focus on downforce, engineers did have to reduce lift, something that road car engineers have to do now, as the flat bottom rounded top of cars can lead to them creating a lot of lift, like a wing. In 1956, 22 year old Swiss engineer and racer Michael May arrived at the Nürburgring 1000 kilometer race with an upside down aeroplane wing attached to his Porsche 550 Spider. Michael had previously seen a picture of an Opel rocket powered car with inverted wings to generate downforce and thought, why not stick that on my car? So he attached a large piece of aerofoil just above the cockpit, being mindful of keeping the center of pressure in the middle of his mid-engine chassis. As you can guess, this meant placing it right where the driver would need to get in. So Michael installed some hinges to tilt the wing and allow the driver to get in, which probably isn't great in a crash. These hinges also meant that he could adjust the wing while he was driving. In the corners, he would position it to get best downforce, and down the straights, he placed it more horizontally to reduce the drag and gain more speed. So yes, they had active aero in 1956, and it did produce better lap times. They would post the fourth best time in practice, beating far more powerful cars and professional opponents like Sir Sterling Moss. And funnily enough, the works Porsche team driving their own wingless 550 Spiders. As you can imagine, the pros and the teams were not happy about it, and they lobbied with the race director and got it banned, because the wing would obstruct the view of the opponents behind him. Sadly, the wing winged 550 Spider would never race, but Michael May would continue and make it to F1. But unfortunately, he didn't see much success and retired in 1961. And I'm not really sure why he didn't bother telling anyone about his upside down wing idea. Despite Michael May's best efforts, wings wouldn't arrive in F1 until 1968 and at a very familiar track. Like many innovations in the early years of Formula One, Colin Chapman and his Lotus team were the first team to move and they incorporated wings into their iconic Lotus 49B for the 1968 Monaco Grand Prix. The car featured rudimentary front and rear wings to suit the street circuit's characteristics. They were custom designed for each car, but still a very basic design. Simple aerofoil shape, essentially an upside down wing. Note how the rear wing is built into the bodywork. That design will return, but wait to see what they came up with in the meantime. The idea was very successful, and in the hands of Graham Hill, it would go on to take pole position and win the race. Hill would post a pole time of 128.2, which was 1.7 seconds faster than his best efforts in the year before, despite the tightening of the harbour chicane, making the track even slower. And the benefits of this new technology were undeniable. Ferrari, Brabham and McLaren would run test wings at the very next event at Spa. 12 years after Michael May's pioneering entrance, wings had well and truly arrived in Formula One. By the end of 1968, pretty much every team was running them. But they had gained a weird looking characteristic. Not quite understanding the forces that those wings would be subject to, the teams had stuck them to a pair of thin stilts attached directly to the suspension. While they looked a bit suspect, this positioning was key. Lotus fitting those high stilted wings on the 49. And this really was probably the best solution because those high stilts didn't mount to the chassis, they mounted directly to the suspension and the upright. So the downforce created by the wing was pushed directly in through the suspension into the tyres. And that meant that you weren't having to compress the suspension from the wing and you basically got the most out of it. Obviously the design of the wings was somewhat limited, but this was the very early days of understanding what downforce generating wings were all about. The location of the suspension uprights was ideal for these wings, but like a lot of things in F1 during this time, their durability and safety were lacking. A series of crashes in 1968 and 1969 had put the rear wings under scrutiny, but the Spanish Grand Prix in 69 would be the last nail in the coffin for this configuration. Both Lotuses of Graham Hill and Jochen Richt would crash heavily after both of their rear wing supports failed at high speeds. The stilts weren't strong enough to withstand loads way higher than anyone expected possible. Luckily, both drivers survived, but the high wing era of Formula 1 was over. What replaced it was a push in the opposite direction. 
the high, thin rear wings of the late 60s were replaced by low-slung, deep trays for the early 70s. In their early specs, they looked like a school dinner tray had been angled and attached to the rear of the car. But as the teams learned more about how the airflow behaved, early development was fast. The teams realized that M-plates reduced drag by stopping the high-pressure air being sucked over the edge of the wing and into the low-pressure area below it. Stopping this made the whole wing more efficient. While gurney flaps installed on the trailing edge of the wing dramatically sharpened the exit angle of the airflow. This created more downforce without having to increase the angle of the whole wing, which of course would create more drag. But these wings still had a fundamental issue to solve. They were mounted just above the gearbox, and while looking cool, that position wasn't very good for aerodynamics, and they weren't getting the benefit of the suction effect under the wing, as there was a mass of suspension and bodywork just beneath it, as it was mounted directly to the rear structures. So eventually, the wings were raised and pushed back until they were mounted on a single strut, away from the hot air and the bodywork. McLaren were one of the first to do this with their M23, while also trying to make the wing as slim as possible to maximize its effectiveness, as rulemakers were imposing size limits on the wings for the first time. And this won't be the last time the rear wing changes due to technical restrictions. Despite the intense development of the rear wing during the 1970s, in the second half of the decade, teams began experimenting with other ways to produce downforce, and one idea threatened to get rid of the rear wing altogether. And these wings got really weird, so we're going to go over some of the weirdest designs at the end of this video. Over at Lotus, designer Peter Wright and founder Colin Chapman had been working in secret on a different philosophy, to generate negative lift, as they called it. The fruits of their labour appeared in full force on the revolutionary Lotus 78 and 79s, which were the first F1 cars to use ground effect. While the 78 was successful, the 79 was a game changer. Instead of using the wings as a primary source of downforce, this new philosophy pushed air underneath the car through a series of venturi tunnels. By sealing that airflow off using skirts around the edge of the car, a larger area of low pressure was created that sucked the car into the ground. With this new philosophy in full force, teams started to think, why do we still have this draggy rear wing when most of our downforce is being produced from the underfloor? These thoughts would bring us some crazy looking cars, including the Lotus 88 from Colin Chapman again, that had two chassis. Well, if you look at them, you might be thinking, I see a rear wing there. And you may be right, but these wings didn't have the same effect as their predecessors. These wings were really just an extension of the side pods and skirts, as this car was made to be basically one big wing. There's also a reason why we didn't see more of them. They didn't really work. At this stage, teams weren't able to get the car stable enough without a separate rear wing. So most teams did run with a small rear wing during that period. These smaller wings started to resemble the simple slick designs of today. But one design that doesn't resemble today's was the Ferrari that turned up the 1982 US Grand Prix in Long Beach, and it's very clever. Back then, the rules stated what the maximum width of the wing could be to limit the downforce the teams could generate. So Ferrari said, fine, we'll just fit two of them, double the wings, double the downforce. This car would only race in Long Beach and would get them a third place finish with Villeneuve before it was quickly disqualified for having, well, two wings. This era didn't last long as ground effect was banned at the end of 1982, and once again the wing would become the primary force of downforce in F1. With the rules still pretty vague, from 1983 onwards, everyone was chasing different ways to find more downforce at the rear of their car, and this produced some really interesting designs. Despite the two-winged Ferrari being disqualified, it didn't stop this idea from being pursued further. Lots of teams were running just with a very steep, very aggressive, normal rear wing, Ferrari, for example, added a couple of extra winglets just in front of the rear wheels attached to the rear wing to add some more downforce. And because these were in front of the rear wheels, they met the regulations. Tolman, the, the car that uh, Ayrton Senna would go on to make his Formula One debut in, had a double rear wing. It had a conventional narrow rear wing. And then in the mid body, held up on a couple of big M plates from the side pods, you had a full span uh, rear wing and it just showed lots of the different ideas that teams were starting to come up with is where they could just add downforce at any cost you know forget about the the drag because they had these massively powerful turbo engines that would overcome the drag with sheer engine power the 80s is my favorite era of f1 cars they just looked so ridiculously wild and angry the way i think f1 cars should but as the technology open to f1 teams got more and more sophisticated with the use of wind tunnels and computer simulations 
understanding airflow became much more scientific. This coupled with the regulations getting tighter and tighter, and the rear wings not only became more uniform, but more detailed. And this would lead to the 1990s. Speaking of scientific approaches, if you're looking to work in Formula One or motorsport in the future, you will need to understand the forces behind the sport. And this is where today's sponsor, Brilliant, can really help. Their website and app is the best place to learn about science, technology, engineering, and maths, with thousands of lessons among over 70 courses that enable you to learn by doing with new content added monthly. I would recommend scientific thinking as a great base for your learning. The course gets you to solve puzzles using scientific methods and grounds them in real world scenarios. I particularly enjoy the section on gears, well, for obvious reasons. The layout of the course makes it really easy for you to absorb the information one step at a time. And they always explain how they get to any specific answer so you aren't left behind. To get started for free, visit brilliant.org forward slash drive61 or click on the link in the description. And the first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. With the regulations getting tighter and tighter over the 1990s, the space in which teams could fit a rear wing and other devices at the back of the car narrowed. So naturally, the rear wings also narrowed. But what the teams did was add more elements within that narrow box they had to work with. The reason you have a multi-element wing is basically if you make a very steep wing, eventually the airflow wants to separate from underneath and the wing stops being efficient and eventually will stall. So if you have slots, you actually inject a little bit of air from the top of the wing, the high pressure area, onto the surface of the underside of the wing, which keeps that airflow attached, which means you can get steeper and steeper and steeper wings until if you look at most Formula One rear wings, the, 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 the very top profile is almost vertical because they've got the airflow worked out. This got quite extreme as the teams just kept on adding extra elements. So as you can imagine, the regulations then restricted the number of elements that a rear wing could have to three. So the teams searched for other ways to add downforce, especially at places like Monaco. Jordan turned up to Monaco in 1996 that had a car with an extra rear wing attached to the engine cover after noticing the regulations weren't specific about what could be done in that area. However, it didn't really help and wasn't copied. Tyrrell saw this idea and decided to go one better in 1997. Like Jordan, they noticed that the regulations left an area just to the side of the cockpit open to play with and installed these high wings on either side of the driver to add more downforce over the center of the car. They were dubbed the X wings and I think you can see why. While not in the traditional rear wing location, they were in fact mini rear wings like the ones Jordan had fitted a year earlier. Unlike Jordan's extra wing, these ones seemed to work. Tyrrell estimated that they added about 5% more downforce. Ferrari, Sauber, Jordan and Prost all ran them during the 1997 and 98 seasons to good reviews. However, once again, the FIA banned them on safety grounds as the wings restricted the driver's view in their mirrors. And to be honest, I was pretty happy about that. I think they do look a bit silly. And moving into the 21st century, the size, location and shape of the rear wing was mainly dictated by regulations trying to create better racing. Teams really focused on how to shape the different areas of the wing to their liking without affecting the wing's strength or integrity. They changed the angle of the wing so it may have a deeper and steeper center section with a much shallower outer section. This was very good for downforce while reducing drag as you weren't creating the vortices at the edges of the wing, but still getting lots of air hitting the center, pushing the car into the ground. Now, to these regulation changes. For the majority of the 2000s, the rear wing was low and wide, creating lots of downforce, but also a Lot of dirty air for the cars behind and i personally think that they looked great on those 2008 cars they all looked pretty awesome so a massive regulation change in 2009 made the rear wings tall and thin this reduced the amount of downforce created as a way to reduce the amount of dirty air behind regulations would then move back to being low and wide for 2017 as f1 tried to make the cars faster and better looking this is all before moving into the regulations that we have today where i believe f1 are making a great step forward to making the cars good looking and racing even better. So there have been some truly crazy designs throughout the years as teams experimented with what was possible. And here are a few of my favorites. Let's start with the March 751 from 1975 and with its skirting board's rear wing. March added an extra element just behind each tire in an attempt to add downforce by adding some ground effect with those lower wing elements. 
The design only lasted one race before the FIA banned them, but not before March scored a double points finish at the British Grand Prix. Next is the Arrows A2 from 1979. Arrows tried to get ahead in the Grand Effect era by removing the conventional rear wing and replacing it with one that was essentially an extension of the side pods and more end plate than anything else. By removing the rear wing, they hoped to get rid of the drag it created without losing performance as the underfloor would create the majority of the downforce anyway. But unfortunately for Arrows, it was too unstable at high speed, so only lasted half a season, which is a shame as it looks spectacular. My personal favourite rear wing innovation came from Tyrrell with their Boomerang 012 in 1983. As they tried to make up for their power deficit to the turbo cars of the day, Tyrrell ran this design at the Austrian Grand Prix to add more downforce. The rules were specific about the maximum width for a rear wing behind the rear axle only. So Tyrrell added an extra wing in front of the axle that could be as wide as the bodywork rules allowed, which was wider than the rear wing rules. The boomerang shape was an attempt to fit as much width as possible, but it created too much drag, so it was dropped for a conventional rear wing setup. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this, go check out our video on the evolution of F1 steering wheels, and I'll see you next time.